Hi, I'm Lee Tushler, Executive Editor of Design World and EE World. And I'm Kelsey Ferrante, Contributing Editor. Our teardown today is a device many people have in their home. It's a cable modem from Scientific Atlanta called the WebStar DCX2100. If you've got broadband internet from a cable company, it comes into your house through a cable modem, something like this one. In our teardown series, this may have been the easiest product to get apart. The case is just two pieces that snap fit together. The electronics all lies on a single circuit board. So disassembly consists of opening the case snap fits and unfastening the PCB from the case. On the board, I see one big chip and a few small ones. Right. What you see here is a single chip cable modem made by Broadcom. A lot of cable boxes use it. This particular chip is the BCM3348, and it isn't the most up-to-date version, but the architecture of the hardware you see on this board isn't much different from what you'd find in the latest and greatest versions. A lot goes on on that chip, and it bears some explanation. It implements what's called DOCSIS 2.0. DOCSIS stands for Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. It's an international standard that lets cable TV systems transmit data as well as TV signals. This particular chip implements the 2.0 version of the standard, which has been around for a while. The most recent version is DOCSIS 3.1. Does that mean this modem is obsolete? Actually, it could still work on most U.S. cable systems. The 3.1 version is for gigabit data streams, and only a few areas in the U.S. have it right now. The 2.0 devices handle in the range of tens of megabits. So how does this chip actually manipulate data? It uses a 200 megahertz MIPS processor to implement quadrature amplitude modulation, QAM. We could spend several videos just explaining how QAM works but basically it's a scheme that conveys two digital bit streams by modulating the amplitudes of two carrier waves using amplitude shift keying. The two carriers have the same frequency but are 90 degrees out of phase with each other, which is why they're called quadrature carriers, which is where the QAM acronym comes in. The modulated waves are summed to yield a final waveform that's a combination of phase shift keying and amplitude shift keying. In the U.S., 64 QAM and 256 QAM are the mandated modulation schemes for digital cable. The 64 and 256 refer to the number of points in the QAM constellation diagram, where each point in the diagram represents a specific digital number specified by a specific amount of amplitude and phase modulation. I think I'm already asleep. What are the other major chips we see on the board? Well, the cable modem is connected to two memory chips, one a synchronous DRAM, the other a flash. So when you buy more download speed from your cable company, a signal gets sent down the cable and the configuration data gets updated in the non-volatile flash memory. That's how they can change aspects of your internet service without actually changing any hardware. So when I boost my download speeds to see Justin Bieber videos more quickly and my cable bill goes up, all I have really paid for is a different value in a flash memory. Pretty much. Terrific. What else can we say about this board? Well, there are a few other chips scattered around the cable modem chip that aren't all that interesting. There's a chip from Micrel used to handle the physical Ethernet interface for the cable, another TI chip for suppressing voltage transients on the USB interface, and a DC-DC controller for supplying the various DC rails uh, the chips need. The more interesting part of the board sits in a metal enclosure to keep out interference and probably also to prevent the modem from radiating RF. We popped the top off the enclosure so you can get a look at the internals. We also had to cut apart the, uh, the metal at one portion to see the markings on one of the chips inside, which turned out to be a saw filter. Why do you need shielding around the part of the circuit? That part of the circuit operates at a much higher frequency than the cable modem chip or the rest of the board. And you don't want that part of the board to operate like an antenna and radiate RF noise. The cable company typically delivers frequency to the modem that are in the range of 50 to 860 megahertz. There's a chip in the shielded area called a tuner that takes those frequencies and reduces them to what are called intermediate frequencies. The intermediate frequencies are in the 36 to 44 megahertz range. Those intermediate frequencies are what gets sent outside the metal enclosure to the cable modem chip. 
And we should also say the process of reducing the incoming signal to lower intermediate frequencies is done in a way that doesn't lose any information coming in on the carrier signals. I see that there are a few other chips inside the enclosure. What else goes on in there? There's one other main chip that sits in front of the tuner. This is an RF front end, and it is basically a linear amplifier and a means of gain control for the incoming cable signal. That just means it compensates for variations in the strength of the signal coming in. There are two other chips in the enclosure we should mention. They are both surface acoustic wave filters, which the cable tuner IC uses in producing the relatively narrow signals sent back to the cable modem chip. There also seems to be a separate enclosed area with a bunch of coils in it. Right. That's what's called a diplexer. It's passive in that it doesn't use any integrated circuits. It basically multiplexes two RF signals from two different ports uh, to a third port. In the case of a cable modem board, that circuit probably also performs some impedance matching, making the cable modem connection look like the same RF impedance as the incoming cable to maximize the power transfer from the modem box to the cable and vice versa. So the passive circuit in there is probably a, a diplexer slash impedance match. Why do you need a diplexer for two signals if you only have one cable tuner chip? The reason is the cable companies send data to the modem at between 50 and 860 megahertz, but the cable modem sends back information in a different frequency band, between 5 megahertz and 42 megahertz. The diplexer is what allows the two signals to coexist on the cable line. And it does so in a way that isolates the two signals from each other so you aren't sending the upload data back through the tuner chip. I get it. So when I watch my Buffy the Vampire Slayer reruns on Netflix, that download happens between 50 and 860 megahertz. But when I email my landlord about a leaky pipe, that uploads between 5 and 42 megahertz. Uh, that's it. To be precise about it, the carrier that holds the information is in those frequency bands. The information itself about uh, Buffy and about your pipes is encoded and decoded off the carriers using the QAM technique we mentioned earlier. Well, as Buffy herself might say, we've certainly driven a stake into the heart of this subject. You can see more teardown videos like this one at the video tab at designworldonline.com.